Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church at the Singing Bridge on this now sunny Sunday morning. We are certainly grateful you have joined us for worship. If you will, at the bottom of the screen, hit that share button. Let other people know that we are on live now so they can join us and participate in worship. But we're certainly grateful for your presence. We sure wish we could be together, but as everyone knows, uh, COVID is actually increasing and we want to keep everyone safe and we appreciate your patience and understanding. Uh, but we miss you very, very much here in the sanctuary, but are grateful for this technology that allows us to worship together each Sunday morning and to gather on Wednesday evenings for prayer meeting. So thank you again for your diligence in getting ready and getting your devices ready and getting online so that we may worship together. This morning, several announcements. I'll run through as quickly as possible. Deacon elections. Uh, this year, a link will be sent out uh, to uh, a ballot for you to fill out. If you do not have online access or know someone who does not have online access, let the church office know so that we can get them a ballot. They will be due next Sunday, uh, November the 22nd, so you'll have this week. I think they will go out tomorrow. And if you will go to that link and you can vote for up to seven uh, new deacons and we're grateful for those who have agreed to serve and that are being presented by our deacon nominating team. The new book study, A Spirituality of Living, begins this Tuesday, November the 17th. And you can see the website or contact Amanda for more details on that. It's a Henry Nowen book. It is a very short book, will not take you more than 30 to 45 minutes to read. Hope that you will uh, get that book and read it and be a part of that book study starting this Tuesday. Next Sunday, we are going to have the hanging of the green in a very unique way. We will have our Christmas trees up and uh, from one o'clock to seven o'clock, you can sign up for a time to come and place a Christmas on one of the trees. Please go to our website and follow that link to sign up. Uh, it is imperative that you sign up. And when you come, there are instructions on the website of how we will do that safely. There will be 15 minute increments and there will be two families allowed at a time, one on the piano side, one on the organ side. We will maintain social distancing. We will also require that you wear a mask at all times while in our building. Uh, but we do want you to come. We want you to experience our beautiful sanctuary. And it will also be an opportunity for you to pick up our new CD, the Sanctuary Choir uh, recorded a Christmas CD back in January, and it will be available to be picked up. And I hope that you will do that and hope you will take some to share with your neighbors and friends and coworkers. Also, Amanda will have some materials to pick up for uh, families with children for the Advent time. Uh, so much happening next Sunday from one to seven, but please, please go to the website and sign up for a time. Virtual nativity display. As you decorate your home this year uh, for Christmas, please take a photo of your nativity display. Your family's welcome to be in the photo as well, but not necessary, and send to kjohnson at fbcfrankfurt.church, and we want to share these throughout December on our FBC media outlets. We're working on the winter edition of recipes from our church family, and these are for soups, stews, sweet and savory breads, and cookies. And if you would send those to Kay Johnson at fbcfrankfurt.church by this Thursday, November the 19th, again, there is a slide on our website that gives you all the details. Our November missions campaign is showing our support for the Franklin County Emergency Food Pantry. Uh, interfaith food drive and it's virtual this year so if you would please uh, out of your generosity help those in need with food by sending a check to be made out to first baptist church with food drive in the memo also just a reminder we have an announcements page now on our website along the top bar of the menu you'll see just announcements you can go and get all of the announcements in one place if you so desire there's also a letter from our pastor explaining our current situation with COVID. Hope you will take the time to read that heartfelt message. And then our Zoom links to Sunday school, small groups, children and youth activities are on our prayer list page. Again, that page is password protected, but you can call the church office or email any of the staff members and we will share that password with you. Mission Frankfurt Clinic Meals, we still have a few dates that we need uh, meals to provide for our volunteers and workers and hope that you will sign up. There's a link on our website. 
Our goal to date, $772,678. Received to date, $667,803. We're grateful for your continued support of the ministries of this church and ask that you continue to do so as the myriad of ministries continue day after day here at First Baptist. We are so grateful that you have joined us for this time of worship. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And we light the Christ candle now to remind us of his eternal presence. He is the light of the world and we have gathered to worship him. We sing a hymn of praise to the Trinity worthy of worship. Join as we sing all three stanzas.
Good morning, friends and family. I hope you and yours are doing well on this very crisp and cool morning. Um, at this time, I invite you to simply, excuse me, to simply um, get yourself comfortable, close your eyes, and just relax as we continue to welcome ourselves in the presence of the Lord. And as you're getting comfortable, as you're able to, I invite you to take a deep inhale through your nose. And exhale slowly out your mouth. Let us pray. Good morning, God. In our gathering for worship, may it be a time of affirmation. May this time affirm our love for you, your presence, and remembering that you are a good, good God. May this time affirm that love knows no boundaries, regardless of the color of one's skin, orientation, nationality, or political beliefs. May this time affirm our deep need and desire for unity in the face of, dis of division, especially within our nation as protests over the recent election continue to take place. May this time affirm our need to slow down and pay attention so our hearts can catch up with our minds in the face of distractions and the fast-paced, hyper-connected world we live in. May this time affirm our need for each other, our companionship, and our longing to be together again in the face of this pandemic. May this time affirm our need to remember to express thanks and to say thank you to the work that you have called those around us to do. May this time also affirm our unique individual needs, which can be so easily tossed to the side in the face of a world that oftentimes attempts to dictate our lives. May this time affirm that you love us even if we think we're not enough, we're unworthy of love, or <laughs> altogether just a hot mess. May this time of worship affirm that we can come as we are. Amen. And it's also at this time um, I invite you to our responsive reading. I will read the light prints, and I invite you to read the bold, entitled Stewardship. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in all good work. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Join as we sing.
Today's story comes from the book of Matthew. This is a story Jesus told, a parable. Parables are stories that Jesus uses to teach us. Sometimes they are larger than life and even a little overdramatic. Sometimes they are hard to understand. But even so, parables invite us to wonder together about what it is like for God's dream to come true. Jesus called this the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. And because it wasn't like any kingdom that anyone had ever visited, or lived in, or known about, people were always asking him about what it was like. This time, when they asked, this is what he said. Once there was a person who was going on a journey. He called three of his servants to come and see him off. Then he took some coins he wanted to keep safe. These weren't just pennies or quarters or nickels or dimes. These were coins that were worth a whole lot of money. The person gave the first servant five coins. He gave the second servant two coins. He gave the third servant one coin. And then he left on his journey. He was gone for a while. While he was gone, the first servant invested the five coins and turned them into ten. The second servant invested the two coins and turned them into four. The third servant, who had only one coin, took it and buried it in the ground for safekeeping. After a while, the person returned from his journey. He asked his servants to give him back his coins. The first servant showed the person that his five coins were now ten. Well done, said the person. Now I can trust you with even more. The second servant showed the person that his two coins were now four. Well done, he said again. Now I can trust you with more, too. The third servant went out and dug up the coin from the ground. He presented it to the man. Sir, I know that you're a tough master, and I didn't want to lose what you gave me, so I buried it and kept it safe. You could have put it in the bank at least, said the person. Then it would be safe and earn a little extra. The person took the one coin from that servant and gave it to the first servant, who already had ten. Then he commanded that the servant who had buried the coin be tossed out into the darkness. This is a bit of a strange story. I wonder what you liked best about this story. I wonder what you liked least. I wonder if you are in this story. I wonder what you wonder about this story. Please pray with me. Loving God, thank you for stories. Help us to listen with open minds and open hearts. Amen.
Hear now the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 14 through 30, the parable of the talents. For it is if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here. You have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing... Even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Yeah. 
Good morning. We're glad that you have joined us on Facebook Live. Let's say a prayer together before we get into the sermon moment. Almighty God, I pray that you'll take the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth, and may they be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. I invite you this morning to open up to Matthew chapter 25 and look at verses 14 through 30. I I love the fact that Jesus told stories in order to get his message across, in order for his message to be remembered. Uh, Everyone may not remember a teaching or a lecture, but a compelling story told by a strong communicator can resonate with someone, with an audience for a lifetime. I think this is what Jesus was doing with his disciples, not only on the occasion that we'll be focusing on uh, this morning, namely the parable of the talents, but so many times Jesus would tell just the right story that brought his audience in close, and and they would recognize the characters, they they would recognize the settings and the storylines. Because Jesus found a way to convey the meaning of his message with something that was familiar within the culture, within the context of the time and space in which he found himself. And this was extremely meaningful for the original audiences, I'm sure, because they related to the stories. They understood all the different components in the stories because, as I said, Jesus used very recognizable, everyday types of people, places, and things so the message would stick to its hearers. Now, all of that is obviously great for those initial hearers of Jesus' stories, but as for us, 2,000 years later, those things familiar to the first century audience most of the time do not resonate as much with us. And I'm sure if Jesus were here today in our culture and context, his stories would just be a lot different. He would use things that relate to our time and space. All of that to say, we have to do a little work when we are examining parables. As Amanda says in her Godly Play Stories concerning the parables, we have to knock on the parable box and see how it may open to us. And on many occasions, we, uh, this, this will take us digging a little, uh, studying a little more, and working to understand the message, but let me say this, and I, I cannot stress it enough: it is worth the work to unlock these parables because some of the most important teachings of Jesus are found in these stories, like we are looking at this morning. We have to remember this is Jesus' one shot to communicate to humanity how to live as his disciples, how to act according to God's will. So so the stakes could not be higher. It is extremely important for us to keep knocking on the lid of the parable boxes in order to understand. Because what we are trying to understand is Jesus, his message about the meaning and purpose of our lives. And it doesn't get any more critical than that, in my opinion. So when we come to these parables in the New Testament, always remember that Jesus is communicating something he wants his disciples to never forget. And that is enough for me to pay very close attention. And I pray as a church we will pay very close attention this morning. Now, what I said about Jesus using familiar things in his stories for his original audience, and that being maybe difficult for us to understand as we're in a different setting, really comes into play this morning as we examine the the parable of the talents. Uh, Modern day people, most modern day people may read the story and don't even know what a talent is, at least in this context. And it's not too terribly difficult for a serious reader to figure out a talent is is some kind of currency or treasure of some sort. In fact, it is. A, A talent was an extraordinary amount of money. 
One talent was worth 6,000 denarii. It's important to know that to know that one denarius would be the daily wage, the daily wage for a common laborer of that day. So a talent, one talent would be roughly equivalent to 20 years wages for the average worker. Five talents, the largest amount entrusted to any of the servants, is comparable to 100 years worth of labor, which is, of course, a crazy amount of money. So Jesus is dealing, as Amanda said earlier, with the overdramatic, the hyperbole, if you will. These amounts would have been an attention grabber for those in attention. In attendance. Now, another compo- component of the story that would likely be unfamiliar to us and actually should be kind of offensive to us is the master slave language and system that is foundational for understanding the story. The, the Greek term for slave does not necessarily mean slave, like we may think of that term in modern. In, in modern terms, it also can mean servant, which would have been an a pl- employer-employee type of relationship. But slavery was certainly a part of the Greco-Roman first century landscape. And, and the way the master deals with one of the servants certainly feels like an unhealthy type of relationship in terms of throwing one out into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? But, but again, I want to urge everyone, as hard as it may be, to push past the problematic components of the story and, and realize Jesus was not endorsing slavery, but he was simply trying to get his message across in a way that would stick with his audience of that time and space. And the under, underlying Christian principles that Jesus is trying to instill in his followers, those principles are transcendent. It reminds me of the old saying, don't throw away the baby with the bathwater. Well, that, that's kind of a troubling saying, <laughs> come to think of it. But what I mean is, just because there are some troubling elements to the story, don't let that take away from the heart of the story, the message. You all have probably heard me say before that it's important when reading Scripture, if, if you have time to read big chunks of Scripture, Instead of one verse or one passage or even one parable, it's important to gain context, to gain a broad vision of what's going on. In fact, the parable that we look at today is a set of three parables that may have been told all at once, and they relate to one another. And this is true for our story today. There, like I said, two preceding parables to our passage today. We don't have to, time to examine them, but they also talk about they also talk about a return of the master and, and how the timing of that return is unknown. So there's a theme going on throughout the stories. And, and that's the basis of our story. The, the master has returned from this extended leave or absence. He has entrusted his property, his money, with three of his servants. Now, the first two servants did outstanding with what was entrusted to them. They lived up to their potential, if you will. They got the job done that seemed to be expected of them. And the third slave confesses that he was fearful to fail with the master's money. He he wanted to protect himself, it seemed like, so he buried the talent in the ground. And this may seem strange to us, but burying money or treasure was quite common in those days. It seems the third slave was unwilling to take a risk He has proven to be unfaithful 
In the end, he attempted to secure his own well-being. In the end, his unfaithfulness to carry on the master's work cost him. And it cost him everything. The primary audience of this parable are the disciples. Uh, And while they may see only what's directly in front of them, Jesus sees the big picture. Jesus sees the writing on the wall, contextually speaking, for this gospel. He knows his subversive teachings are going to eventually get him into big-time trouble. That his calls for an alternate kingdom of God compared to the corrupt kingdom or empire of Rome would sooner or later catch up with him and get him into clashes with those whose job was to do away with potential uprisings of those who didn't pledge full allegiance to the empire. Jesus sees it coming, and he wants to prepare his followers for the difficult days they're going to have to endure when he is gone, when he is absent. And so he conveys this story, as he did with two stories that came before, this understanding that the master would have to go away for an indeterminate amount of time, but that the servants of that master would need to continue the work. That they would be given a huge responsibility to multiply the work, to take risk, to invest what the master had given them. Because with the master gone, it's the only way to grow the estate for the servants to carry on the work. The gifts, the currency, the grace they'd been given should not be buried away. Because this, of course, means the work stalls. Being stagnant is not an option for the master. And while that may seem to be a safe and peaceful way to live out our lives by burying the talents that the master entrusted to us, that is not the way. That is not profitable for the estate. That is not pleasing to the master. And when the master returns, those who continue the work, who carried on the mission and labored to expand and took risks to grow the master's product, they will be invited to enter into the master's joy. Those who received the initial gift and entrusted with the currency and yet buried it away, they will realize their choice cost them everything. Now, as I said, the disciples are the original audience here. Jesus is trying to prepare them for difficult days ahead, and the message could not be more clear. When the master leaves, carry on the work. Take risks to make a profit in the disciples' case. Take risks to build the kingdom of God, to advance the gospel, to advance God's will. And at times that's going to be risky, but it is worth the risk. When the master leaves, emulate his behavior. He's entrusted to you these teachings on how to live, how to bring the kingdom of God to earth as it is in heaven. Do this with all due diligence and thoroughness. Do this work with endurance and perseverance because the work of the master is the most important work. It is the work that can heal the world. It is the work that can bring justice, that can bring equality, that can bring kindness and compassion. It is the work that can bring lost souls to their founder. It is the work that can lift up the lowly, cure the diseased, inclusion of the marginalized, love to the unlovable, forgiveness to the sinner, hope To those in despair. Jesus was saying. Do the work. That you saw me doing. With people like Zacchaeus. With the woman at the well. With the leper colonies. With the impoverished. With the disinherited. 
The work I did in combating the legalism and corruption and fundamentalism of the Pharisees. The work I did as I healed the bleeding woman who had been isolated, terrorized for 12 years. Call those people family as I called her daughter. Include them. Fight for the ones like the adulterous woman that everyone else thought should be stoned. But I showed her mercy and I fought for her life because everyone needs a second chance. Do this work. Don't bury it away. Don't leave it in a field. It is the pearl worth finding. It is the coin worth sweeping the house for. It is the city on a hill. This work can be the light of the world. And this work I've entrusted to you must have love at its core. Agape must be its beginning and end. Don't bury it away. Don't just see it as some good teaching to put it in a book somewhere. Don't see it as something to just bring out every once in a while. Do it for your life and make it your lifestyle as I did, as I emulated, as you emulate what I've done. Jesus will tell them not too far from the passage we concentrate on this morning that he's going away. But that he will return. I I can't help but imagine the disciples, at at least some of them, going back to this parable of the talents in their minds as they heard Jesus saying he would return and come back. They called him master, even though he told them he had not come to be served but to serve. They were his servants. They were his disciples. They were the ones entrusted with the talents that he freely bestowed upon them. They were the ones now responsible for carrying on the work of the master. And they knew then of his promise to return, just like the master in the parable. And what did they do? They carried on his work. They took the risks, they endured, they persevered, they were faithful, they multiplied the kingdom. And this is where the message, the core of the story becomes transcendent to any time, to any generation, to you and to me. We are his followers. We have been entrusted with the currency of the greatest news the world could ever hear. We have been entrusted to do, to do the work that could heal every wound, that could squash every injustice, that could alleviate poverty, that could bring hope to every despair. And just like those original disciples, we know, we believe, we have this promise of Jesus Return, And God has never gone back on any of his promises. What will we have done with our lives that we've been given? What will we have done with the good news and great commission and the greatest commandments that we have been given? It's not too late. It's not too early to do the work, to get to work. With all his teachings, with all his stories, parables, with all his healings and efforts, Jesus was showing the disciples there is a new way. There is a better way than what is being taught to you. And the world would never be the same. Jesus was showing his followers that the ways of the world need to be turned upside down. God's dream for the world is different than what the world says it should be about. And you know the dream. You know the kingdom. Selfless instead of selfish. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. The last shall be first. Walk the extra mile for your brother and sister. It's not about getting revenge, so turn the other cheek, show mercy, show grace. It's not about getting, it's about giving. It's not about tearing down, it is about building up. 
God's dream for the world is not for you to sit on the wonderful gifts he has given you, but to put those talents to work for the building of God's kingdom, for the realization of God's dream. What are we doing with what God has given us? When Jesus returns, what will he discover about how we either invested or squandered this life that he's given? Maybe this afternoon or this week, at some point, we could isolate ourselves, look back over this parable, and think about what our lives look like and what we prioritize and how we treat one another and how we are implementing God's dream into this world, how we are bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth as it is in heaven. Because Jesus will return. He will. And we will be accountable for all that we've done, for all that we haven't done. It is important. It is the most important thing to get our lives in order to bring God's kingdom, God's dream to realization. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, I thank you um, for this Sunday's service, for the beautiful music we've heard, for the important prayers that have been said, for your Holy Scripture to be read, for your word to be preached. And I pray, God, that we may take all of it Digest it, process it, and may it change us. May it transform us into the likeness of your Son. This world needs strong representatives of your Son. They need that light and love and mercy and grace and compassion and kindness and healing. We need that in our world today, God, now more than ever. And I, so I pray, God, that we may do our part and think about what we've learned today. Think about how we may implement what we've learned. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Again, I want to thank you all for being a part of our virtual service this morning. We continue on this, uh, on this road of not being in person, but I, I do want to echo what Richard said. We, we miss you. We love you. Uh, we're grateful for you, grateful for your participation, engagement, even in these difficult times. It means the world to us as your staff, and my prayer from the beginning has been that God, through his Holy Spirit, would connect and grow us in ways in which we never imagined during this time. And I believe that's happening, but it will take recommitments from us each and every week to stick together as a community of faith, to be able to persevere and endure uh, this time. Number one, because it's an act of loving our neighbor. And I pray that we will do so and, and make that resolve, make those commitments uh, to be diligent about what we can do to mitigate the spread of the virus that is so uh, permeating our nation and our world right now. I do want to close with a prayer in just a moment. Uh, Richard will uh, lead us in the benediction, but I, I want to pray about our situation and how we continue to move forward. But before I do that, I want to uh, offer an invitation that's really God's invitation to you. And it's an invitation for all of us. And the invitation may look or sound different to each of us, but the invitation is the same. And that is to come into deeper relationship with God through Jesus Christ whether you have never launched out into a relationship with God, 
That is something that is possible today. Jesus made it possible. And you can come to Jesus and ask for his saving grace, forgiveness of your sin, and be in relationship with God. For the rest of us, it is about deepening our relationship with God and living it out and expressing it in such a way that the world recognizes that something is very different. Just as the world was recognizing something very different about Jesus and the way in which he was showing his disciples to live. So I pray we'll make those commitments. I do want to uh, say a prayer today about uh, the situation that we're in with this virus. And I, and I hope that it will, you will connect with this prayer. And, and if you agree with these prayers, I, I, I hope that you will say them as well with me. Let's pray together. Uh, gracious and loving God, we continue to lift up to you uh, this harmful uh, virus, God, that we may see the eradication of this virus sooner than later. We know, God, there is so much that we can learn from these times, even times of suffering and difficulty. But, God, we, we know that it is taking a toll and has on so many families who are grieving today because they've lost their mom or dad or grandfather or grandmother or brother, or sister, or cousin, whatever. So we pray for them. We pray for those, God, that are filling up the ICU rooms of the hospitals across our country. For those who are struggling with this virus. Who are dealing with life and death situations. For those that are surrounding them. For the doctors and caregivers and nurses and everyone involved in the treatment. God, for all of those involved in trying to uh, create and, and, and come up with this vaccine, we pray for its implementation, a safe implementation, soon. We lift it up to you, God. We join a great chorus of prayers I know around the world to you to help us during this time. In Jesus' name. God be with us until we meet again. Secure.